Good afternoon and welcome to the Jerusalem Fund and Palestine Center. My name is Zena Azam. I'm the executive director here, and I'm very happy to have all of you with us today. We are so pleased and so honored that Christopher Hedges has accepted our invitation to speak at the Palestine Center. Welcome, Chris. Ahlan wa sahlan. And the subject he's addressing, the BDS, or Boycott, Divestment, and Sanctions movement, is most timely indeed. He links the growth of this movement to an increase in economic pressure on Israel, which could help pave the way to a fair and equitable solution to the Israeli-Palestinian issue. Our speaker will have the floor for about 40 minutes, after which I'll invite you to ask your questions, and viewers online can tweet their questions to at Palestine Center. So let me introduce our distinguished speaker. Christopher Hedges is a Pul Pulitzer Prize winning journalist and former Middle East Bureau Chief for the New York Times. He writes a weekly column on the truthdick.com website that tackles a, a wide variety of subjects, such as the American, such as American militarism and imperial power, BDS, human rights, the animal agriculture industry, police brutality, the prison system, and these are just a few of his recent articles. His breadth and depth of knowledge and analysis is truly amazing. Chris is the author of 12 books, notably the New York Times bestseller, Days of Destruction, Days of Revolt, which he co-authored with the cartoonist Joe Sacco. His other books include Death of the Liberal Class, Empire of Illusion, The End of Literacy, and The Triumph of Spectacle, I Don't Believe in Atheists, and the best-selling American Fascists, The Christian Right, and The War on America. He's a senior fellow at the Nation Institute in New York City. He's taught at Columbia, NYU, Princeton, and the University of Toronto, and currently teaches prisoners at a maximum security prison in New Jersey. Chris Hedges has covered conflicts with, for 20 years in Central America, the Middle East, Africa, and the Balkans. He has reported for more than 50 countries and has worked for the Christian Science Monitor, National Public Radio, the Dallas Morning News, and the New York Times, for which he was a foreign correspondent for 15 years. He's also written for a number of publications, such as Harper's Magazine, Le Monde, the New York Review of Books, and Foreign Affairs. He speaks Arabic, French, and Spanish. In fact, he just held an interview all in Spanish. He holds a Master of Divinity degree from Harvard. In 2014, Chris Hedges was ordained as a minister at the Second Presbyterian Church. So welcome, Christopher Hedges. Thank you very much. Um, the corruption within our own political system where we've reached a point where money has replaced the vote, where our two major political parties are completely hostage to corporate power, where the judiciary has become a wholly owned subsidiary of the corporate state, and where the arms industry and our bloated military have essentially seized control <coughs> of foreign policy, uh, sucking up such massive amounts of our national budget, 50, about 54 percent officially, but that doesn't count Veterans Affairs, it doesn't count our nuclear weapons program, and it doesn't account for the millions of dollars that are hidden within black budgets that were not allowed to see by some estimates pushing uh, expenditures on the military up to $1.6 trillion a year. Uh, means that we have undergone what the Canadian philosopher John Ralston Saul correctly calls a coup d'etat in slow motion. Uh, and it's over. Uh, they've won. 
Uh, we live in a system now uh, that the political philosopher Sheldon Wolin, uh, our greatest living political philosopher, the author of the seminal work Politics and Vision, which is the history of Western political thought, and, uh, and then the book Democracy Incorporated, which I urge you all to read, uh, which examines uh, the, the, the actual configurations of power in the United States that he describes as inverted totalitarianism. And by that, he means it's not classical totalitarianism. It doesn't find its expression through a demagogue or a charismatic leader, but through the anonymity of the corporate state, that you have corporate forces that purport to pay fealty to electoral politics, the Constitution, the iconography and language of American patriotism, and yet internally have seized all of the levers of power to render the citizen impotent. We have seen a consolidation of corporate power in particular in the media. Uh, and this was given to us by Bill Clinton, Clinton embodying, like Tony Blair and Gordon Brown, uh, with new labor. And, of course, we've seen this dramatic insurgency in Britain with the rise of Jeremy Corbyn, who actually, unlike Bernie Sanders, is a socialist, um, and, uh, and who we will watch now, the Labor Party and the establishment, the neoliberal establishment, work to destroy uh, um, as fast as they can in the same way that uh, our own insurgency in 1972 with the rise of George McGovern as a Democratic nominee saw the Democratic establishment allied with the Republican and the rest of the power elite uh, make sure that another McGovern would never happen uh, within the Democratic Party. Um, but the media is quite worrying, and, and Clinton embodies, and I, I write in my book, Death of the Liberal Class, a lot about this process, but Clinton, like Obama, embodies this kind of faux liberalism where you continue to speak in that feel-your-pain language of the liberal but assiduously serve corporate power. Uh, so many of the assaults on working men and women, uh, many of the uh, uh, impediments that you know were used to stay the hand of imperialism were lifted under the Clinton administration, of course, NAFTA, 1994, the greatest betrayal of the working class in this country since the Taft-Hartley Act in 1948, which makes it hard to organize, uh, the destruction of welfare under Clinton and 70 percent of the original recipients under our old welfare system were children, uh, destruction of Glass-Steagall, the explosion of the prison uh, population with the omnibus crime bills that Clinton passed, as well as these draconian three strikes your outlaws. Uh, but the media I'm going to focus on in particular because Clinton deregulated the FCC. And what that did uh, is allowed, especially the airwaves, to be consolidated into the hands of about a half dozen corporations. Rupert Murdoch's News Corp, Viacom, General Electric, uh, Clear Channel, Disney, uh, and this is uh, unlike the old media monopolies, the old Hearst monopolies uh, of an earlier period. Uh, these are essentially put media uh, entities uh, under the umbrella of giant corporations, so media becomes just one revenue stream that has to perform against other revenue streams, including, of course, in General Electric, huge defense contracts. And that uh, really destroyed, especially the electronic media, completely and shut out uh, any uh, kind of rational debate uh, about anything in American society, and in particular, foreign policy. So if you remember, if we go back to the debate about whether we should intervene in Syria, the debate, debate largely broke down around two arguments. One was, we should, should we just bomb them, or should we bomb them and put boots on the ground? That was really the debate, as if those were the two options uh, that were laid out for us. And I now look at the media, and I'm old enough to have uh, begun in the press. I started covering the war in El Salvador in the early 1980s. Uh, I've watched the devolution of the press, the deterioration, destruction, and in particular of public broadcasting and NPR. Um, and so voices that should be heard uh, have essentially been locked out 
uh, options that should be discussed have been uh, silenced. And um, that has, of course, benefited uh, the power elite, uh, and in particular the neoliberal forces uh, that are defined in the United States as the Israeli lobby. Um, it isn't, of course, the Israeli lobby. I'm old enough to remember and had covered Yitzhak Rabin's campaign for prime minister. And uh, when Rabin ran for prime minister in Israel, uh, these, this so-called Israeli lobby was funneling uh, money, advisors, uh, in to defeat Rabin and promote uh, Likud and later Kadima, the, the Netanyahu, the neoliberals. The, this is a movement, and Norman Finkelstein, I think, has pointed this out correctly, that is a neoliberal project. Um, it's not an Israeli project. Uh, and what's happened in Israel, and I lived in Jerusalem uh, in uh, the late uh, 1980s, actually was, got there just in time for the first intifada, uh, and what, what's happened in Israel, which now has some of the highest levels of inequality, uh, a harsh security and surveillance state, uh, harassment, oh, I'm talking about Israeli dissidents, and we weren't even talking about the repression of Palestinians, uh, it mirrors what's happened within the American project. It's a neoliberal project. And uh, the AIPAC and groups like that were picketing Rabin's house uh, outside of Tel Aviv. I think he was in Herzliya. And uh, 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 did everything they could to make sure that Rabin would not become prime minister. And when he did, uh, Rabin did not invite any of these groups to his inauguration. Uh, and there was a story, it may be apocryphal, but knowing Rabin, it, it, it sounds credible. He was a fairly earthy guy. Um, and I heard from someone in his office that on his first uh, trip to Washington, uh, a, he, APAC put out uh, a request to meet with him, and Rabin's response was, I don't meet with scumbags, uh, or the equivalent in Hebrew. Um, but that was if he didn't say it, and um, that certainly was his attitude. So I think that we forget that the so-called Israeli lobby does not serve the interests of Israel. It serves the interests of the neocons and the neoliberal uh, mandarins who uh, speak to their own citizens and to the rest of the world exclusively in the language of austerity and violence. Um, and these people are frightening uh, because they are culturally, historically, and linguistically illiterate. Uh, you, you look at the whole project to invade Iraq, and I, I spent seven years in the Middle East, much of that time in Iraq, uh, and all of the uh, excuses and visions that were imparted to justify that invasion and occupation, which has, I think, arguably become the most uh, dangerous and um, costly strategic decision ever made in American history, um, were non-reality based. I mean, the idea that Bathys would greet us as liberators or that democracy would be implanted uh, in Baghdad and emanate outwards across the Middle East and in particular to Iran, uh, that the oil revenues would pay for the reconstruction. Uh, all of this was uh, um, utopian um, to go back to the original root of the world, which means no place. Um, I mean, it's hard to think of Dick Cheney as a utopian. Um, but in this way, he was. And of course, we have paid for that ignorance. Iraq as a unified country is never coming back. We've lost the war in Afghanistan. Um, and the people, the only people who profit from this war, General Dynamics, Raytheon, Halliburton, and believe me, they are not sitting around their boardrooms saying, how can we make peace in the Middle East? Because their stock prices have quadrupled since 9-11. They're sitting around along with uh, our war machine, the Pentagon and the military, which I think has become the most dangerous institution to American democracy, figuring how they can perpetuate endless war. And it's a seamless transition. I mean, guess where all these generals go to work? 
uh, once they retire. Um, so the corruption within the political landscape, um, the fact that we have seized up that 100 senators last summer, like APAC wind-up dolls, including Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders, could actually vote to justify what can only be described as a massacre. Um, when you attack a population that has no army, no navy, no mechanized units, no air force, no command and control, that is not a war. That is murder. And uh, the inability on the part, and this of course again because the media is completely controlled, the inability to present the fact that under international law, a subject population that is attacked has a right to defend itself. Hamas had a right under international law to defend itself. And that's not to defend the Qasem rockets, I think Norman Finkelstein called them enhanced fireworks. Um, they were a war crime because they were indiscriminate, but set against the war crime perpetuated by Israel, 2,000 dead, including over 500 children, uh, the tonnage, I mean the, the tens of tons or hundreds of tons of explosives that were delivered on Gaza. Almost all, of course, of the Israelis who were killed were soldiers and almost all of them were killed in Gaza or near the border of Gaza by Hamas fighters. Um, but that, that fact, that reality is something that is, was utterly locked out of public debate. Um, and the coverage subservient to Israel were pictures of Israelis, you know, running to their basements or, you know, rockets and air raid sirens going off while entire apartment complexes were blown to smithereens by 1,000 pound iron fragmentation bombs. And I've been in Gaza when the Israelis have bombed it. Uh, and I've gone to the bomb sites. I mean, the, the disparity between the description, uh, which is always described as a surgical strike against a bomb-making factory in Jabali or wherever, and then you go and you see the destructive power of these explosive devices where whole blocks are taken out and, and civilian bodies, including children, are lined up. And then to hear the account of what happened emanating out of Jerusalem and echoed by the international press and to stand on the street and see the reality is a window into the big lie. And Israel is quite, quite adept at the big lie. And it's done for two reasons. One, the Israeli public no longer has any contact with Palestinians. Uh, so their version of reality is created for them by the Israeli government. But secondly, it's also a message to the Palestinian people where they talk about how they uh, don't target civilians and, uh, you know, they'll drop warning uh, thuds on roofs. When, you, when the, 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 the message is so at odds with the indiscriminate use of uh, high explosives uh, that it says to the, it, it, it says, sends a message to the Palestinian people that says that, your truth is utterly irrelevant. Um, that it, it is a way of reinforcing the fact that Israel will never cease its reign of terror against the Palestinian people. I have no hope left that we are ever going to be able through the formal mechanism of politics uh, and perhaps even the press uh, bring justice to the Palestinian people. Uh, what has been happening is uh, the rise of an unfettered, racist, rabidly right wing. Um, I mean, when I covered Israel, the idea that the, the ideology of, of uh, Kahane uh, would become mainstream was unthinkable. And yet you listen to Le Avidor Lieberman and others, um, they echo Kah and these racist, fascist, 
Jewish groups now within the mainstream. Um, and uh, we have seen physically uh, huge seizures of land. East Jerusalem is unrecognizable because of the building uh, by the Israeli government and the mass evictions. Uh, Forty percent of the West Bank is gone. The aquifers have been seized. Uh, and if, when I don't have to tell many people in this room, you know, but I mean, if you look at the map of the West Bank, they have just created, uh, you know, half dozen or more isolated pods, ghettos, completely surrounded by ring roads and closed zones that at the flick of a switch create little Gazas. Uh, there's been an Africanization of the Palestinian on purpose so that those with means flee and the rest of the Palestinian population, especially in Gaza but also in the West Bank, are forced to, to put all of their energy into survival, into subsistence level. Um, it is, as, as Pape has said, a, a slow motion genocide. And uh, at this point, all restraints on this uh, slow motion genocide uh, are lifted. The, the, the Obama's White House has made no secret of its distaste for Bibi Netanyahu, not surprisingly having met Bibi, that's understandable. He's certainly one of the most arrogant, unpleasant human beings uh, I've ever run across. Um, and yet they're powerless. They're utterly powerless uh, because uh, the Israeli lobby, through money, just like corporations, uh, have essentially gamed the system uh, and, uh, and prevented um, any kind of restraint and any kind of rational debate. And that brings us to BDS. Uh, the boycott, divestment, and sanction movement is our last best hope to save the Palestinian people. And if it fails, um, Palestine will be obliterated. And if you don't think that's the plan, just pull out a map uh, and look what Israel is doing. Um, the BDS movement will succeed only through the grassroots. Uh, lobbying your congressman or write, writing letters or sending petitions is an utter waste of your time. At this point, we have to begin to mobilize at the local level within institutions. And I'm, I come out of the Presbyterian Church, and by four votes last year, they approved sanctions against Israel. Um, we are seeing at universities a war carried out, orchestrated by the Israeli lobby against groups like Students for Justice in Palestine, and I spoke at Northeastern uh, right after that movement had been uh, banned by the administration. Uh, and, uh, you know, when they ban those students, it, 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 ha it always, always follows the same pattern where they not only ban the organization, but all students who are in the organization are stripped of their leadership positions on the university campus, even if it has nothing to do with Palestine. So you're watching student council members, student presidents being stripped of their position. And often these students are then placed on probation. And the fact that the forms of punishment are replicated from university to university, I think, are an indication of how coordinated uh, this effort is. Um, Israel's running scared. Uh, we just saw uh, with the election of uh, uh, Jeremy um, Corbett at the uh, with the Labor Party, a, a strong supporter. He, he, he hasn't officially supported BDS, but he supports all of the goals of BDS, including a two-way arms embargo, i.e. we will not ship or uh, sell arms to Israel. And 
and that's why you have a kind of two-tiered response where uh, the Israeli lobby through money essentially neutralizes the power elite or uh, buys off the power elite um, and then on the grassroots level orchestrates a campaign to make war against those people who are organizing uh, around boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And just like South Africa, it's going to work in exactly the same way. One, it's going to take time. But secondly, it's going to begin institution by institution by institution. And Israel's terrified. Because in the international community, Israel is a pariah. And if the props of the United States are knocked out from under Israel, then it will be forced to negotiate a solution with the Palestinian people. So people ask, you know, two state, one state, that's, and, and whether BDS should, uh, uh, you know, endorse, that's, that's not what we're working for. At this point, we're working to cripple Israel, to speak to Israel in the only language it will understand, and force it to sit down and negotiate with the Palestinians to create uh, a system by which the Palestinians can live with justice and with dignity. And that will only come when the BDS movement gains significant momentum within the heart of empire itself. Uh, and it's there. Um, one of the things that I find most interesting when I go to universities is, uh, and I meet with the students for justice in Palestine, is often half of them are Jewish. That the consciousness among Jewish students about being what is the war crimes and the injustices that are being committed always, of course, in the cloak of Judaism is one that has radicalized a significant segment of especially Jewish American youth. And um, you can see that when Israel goes after those who are uh, speaking out on behalf of the Palestinians, their special venom is always reserved for those who are Jewish. Noam Chomsky, Norman Finkelstein, Max Blumenthal, and others. Um, because those are um, Jews who essentially have retained, I would argue, not only their conscience, but, and many of them, I mean, gnomes as secular as you can get, but many of them, their faithfulness to the reality of Judaism itself. Because Judaism was a religion that was written by an oppressed people. And it was acutely concerned with the oppressed and with the corruption and violence of power. Um, what's going to happen? Israel will as this movement grows and as the consciousness of what Israel has become emanates outwards, uh, we'll have to build alliances with the most retrograde political forces in the United States. And uh, that is a tactical decision. Uh, they understand that support, especially among young uh, Jews within the United States is at best usually apathetic and often hostile to what Israel has done. And so they are building and have built uh, an alliance with the Christian right. And uh, I come out of the liberal Presbyterian church. As you heard, I, I work in a prison and I was ordained last year uh, to work in that in the prison. And the failure of the liberal Christian church is that it's not named the Christian right for what it is. Um, they are Christian heretics. They are not Christians. 
Jesus did not come to give us a Cadillac and make us wealthy, and you don't have to spend three years at Harvard Divinity School, as I did, to figure that out. Um, these forces have uh, sanctified the most um, destructive elements in America, capitalism, militarism, imperialism, racism, and given it the veneer of religious authenticity. And they are a powerful and dangerous force within American society. We are seeing them flock to rallies by figures like Trump and others. Um, they are a product of despair, of economic collapse, of a loss of hope. Uh, I was just in the South in uh, Alabama and it's one Confederate memorial after another. And uh, as I was walking through the streets of Montgomery with the great uh, civil rights attorney, Brian Stevenson, who spent his life defending death row inmate scores, not surprisingly, most of whom are black and poor, he said these have all been put up in the last 10 years, including a gigantic Confederate flag, half of Montgomery's black, outside the city of Montgomery by the sons of the Confederacy. They had just had a reenactment of the inauguration of Jefferson Davis. The first Southern White House was in Montgomery where a bunch of white guys got up and dressed like Confederate soldiers and marched through the streets of the city while somebody dressed up like Jefferson Davis in a carriage and they went to the steps of the Capitol and they reenacted the inauguration. And I said to Brian that it reminded me of Yugoslavia where with the economic collapse of Yugoslavia, you, you rose up these kind of mythical ethnic narratives, Serb, Croat primarily, um, which were all these people had left. And you vomited up these figures like Radovan Karadzic or Slobodan Milosevic. We're seeing the same distortion within American society as we are reconfigured uh, under neoliberalism to a kind of neo-feudalism, a world where up to two-thirds of this country is now hanging on by their fingertips. To be a member of the working poor, as Barbara Ehrenreich says correctly, in the United States is one long emergency. And the Israeli lobby and the Israeli government has tactically built alliances with these forces, which are deeply anti-democratic, celebrate the gun culture, have fused the language and symbols of American Christianity with the state, which is fascism. And, uh, and I think at that point we can argue that the Israeli lobby ha is aiding and abetting the most powerful elements within American society that seek to destroy our own open society. Uh, and as somebody who does, I spent 20 years as a war correspondent, I know what violence is, and I'm not finally a pacifist. I was in Sarajevo uh, during the war when we were being hit with 2,000 shells a day, constant sniper fire, uh, two dozen wounded a day, four to five dead a day. We knew that if the Serbs broke through that trench system, uh, a third of the city would be slaughtered and the rest would be driven into refugee and displacement camps. Uh, and, and that wasn't conjecture because that's what happened in the Drina Valley, that's what happened in Vukovar. Uh, and yet I understand the poison of violence, that once you pick up violence, and I think this is applicable to Gaza, um, even in a supposedly just cause, um, you are contaminated by violence. And so while it's still possible um, before our society unravels. Um, I think it is incumbent upon all of us who care about justice and who care about nonviolence to put all of our efforts into the BDS movement to bring justice finally to Palestine. Thank you. Uh, Benjamin Tua, where do you put uh, the Episcopal Church 
and the Catholic Church uh, in their movement uh, towards uh, BDS. Uh, so far, they've not gone uh, very far. Well, I, I don't know. The, I know that, like, with the, with the Presbyterian Church, it passed by four votes. And I know that the Israeli lobby has mounted a fierce counter campaign so that at the general convention or general assembly of the Presbyterian Church in June, they hope to get that reversed. Um, so, as I mentioned before, they operate on two tiers. One, essentially buying off the power elites. And secondly, really following in minute detail what's happening within institutions, uh, including churches and universities, and crushing um, at a grassroots level any attempt to organize around BDS. So what's actually, I, kn the, I know the Catholics and the, and the Episcopalians have not endorsed it, um, but you know, exactly you know, what kind of support is happening within those denominations, I don't know. I'm going to your comments at the end of your talk about violence. Um, I've been reading a number of articles about all the different kinds of weapons, the most expensive and sophisticated we have that we are planning to give, sell, give to Israel and to the Saudis and others in um, the Arab Peninsula. And I just sort of see that we're setting ourselves up for sparking even bigger conflagrations there um, by funding all of this. And I would like your comments sort of on what you think about sort of this trade-off, this kind of sub rosa under the table that the administration is doing to further arm um, a very volatile area. Well, you know, I would say at this point arms merchants are, you know, about as close as we get to evil incarnate. Um, and, and because they have a lock now on foreign policy, um, they are – destroying. I mean, we just look at Iraq. Iraq is a unified country is never coming back. Uh, we've lost the war in Afghanistan. Uh, we are terrorizing all sorts of countries we're not even at war with, Pakistan, Somalia, Yemen. Um, and the indiscriminate use of industrial violence you know, which in essence when you brutalize people, as long as we have brutalized people in Iraq, then the brutalized become brutal. So when ISIS, which we created, captures a Jordanian pilot, they put him in a cage and burn him. Why? Because every single day families are being incinerated in their houses through NATO or coalition bombing. Now, what they did was cruder, but morally it's the same. I mean, the fact is we have decapitated through airstrikes and militarized drones far more people, including children, than ISIS has ever decapitated. But we don't see what's happening on the other end. We don't understand what we have done, just as the saturation bombing of Cambodia produced Pol Pot. And it is a natural reaction. So if you read the accounts of the Sobibor death camp uprising, when Jewish inmates get crude knives and weapons and attack the guards, there's an account of one of them breaking into an office, and there's a German, and he has a knife, and he goes, this is for my mother, this is for my father, this is for my sister. We see the final conflagration, the final hysteria, but we don't see the long, slow drip of humiliation, abuse, violence, pain that creates the reaction. And this is also true for African Americans who live in our inner cities. We are most of us who are not in those areas or in the systems of mass incarceration don't understand day by day by day what it means to be crushed. And I'm not defending it. You know, to understand is not to condone. But if you don't understand, you can't react. 
And that gets back to the destruction of our media, where we've been locked out from the from the very possibility of understanding. And if we don't understand, then we are allowed to be sold this mantra that the violence that created the problem is the solution. Bombing Syria day after day is not going to make things better. Um, and that, of course, is what the whole neoliberal project is about. It's about ex speaking to the rest of the world exclusively in the language of force. And it has upended every purported value or agenda that we had when we, went, when we went into Iraq. I mean, we are bombing Syria on behalf of the Assad regime, who, of course, Hezbollah is fighting with the Syrians. So we are, in essence, we have, in essence, become Hezbollah's air force. We are building tactical alliances with Iranian militias and Iranian-backed militias throughout Iraq. Baghdad is an Iranian puppet state. And that's what happens when you open the Pandora's box of violence. You lose control. Uh, and more violence is just more catastrophe. Thank you, Chris, for speaking truthfully and openly. So uh, we at JVP actually are organizing around BDS, and I'm inviting everyone to join us on October 11th at 2 o'clock at Columbia Heights Mall. Sorry? Jewish Voice for Peace. And the only way we're going to get there is through them. So please join on October 11th at 2 o'clock at Columbia Heights Mall. Uh, what you're saying is all true, and I agree with it 100%, but it's pretty depressing, especially when you tell us do not lobby your senators or anyone. We, we just came out of lobbying our senators for the Iran deal, and we were successful there. So, or do you consider that a success or not? And if that was a success, why not do it also for the Israeli-Palestinian issue? Well, the Iran, the Iran deal... Um, was presented as a foreign policy decision that was harmful to Israel. But when you run up against the Israeli lobby, it is much more existential. It's about the very viability of Israel itself. And um, within the political climate of the United States, that's something that elected officials won't confront. Uh, and I think that the vote last summer is a perfect window. I, I mean, the fact is it's driven, you know, it's driven, our politics are driven primarily by money. I mean, the reason we have 35 or 40,000 corporate lobbyists on K Street writing legislation is because our elected officials depend on them for the money in order to run their campaign ads and get reelected. Uh, and, and so that and the, the very kind of liberal wing of the Democratic Party that once existed doesn't exist anymore. It exists in name, but not in reality. And Ralph Nader, who I'm a huge admirer of, uh, and uh, who probably understands corporate power better than any other American, uh, you know, has kind of laid out that process. I mean, Nader authored 24 pieces of legislation, OSHA, the Mine and Safety Act, the Clean Water Act, but he, and he, he authored it but got it through a liberal wing which was eviscerated, especially by Clinton. I mean, by... by the 90s, the Democratic Party under Clinton had fundraising parity with the Republican Party. Uh, and when Ob Obama ran in 2008, he got more. Uh, but the, the quid pro quo was that they, they would serve corporate power and corporate interests. And those within the party who would not serve corporate power and corporate interests, people like Dennis Kucinich, 
were treated as pariahs by other Democrats and pushed out. So I, I just I think our energy has to go into building grassroots movements within institutions uh, as kind of building blocks where university after university, church after church, pension fund after pension fund calls for in the same way we did with South Africa. And, and I think that is I, I just I think going up and knocking on a congressman's door, given the limited amount of energy we all have, is not a particularly useful act at this point. Thank you very much for your time today. My name is Dargo. Uh, I just was curious as to what your thoughts are on adding a third tier regarding BDS uh, today. The conversation is, of course, here centered around the U.S. and what's going on in the political landscape here locally, but it seems that Israel is also in a race to build alliances elsewhere with arm exports to some Asian countries, surpassing that nearly five times to the U.S., as far as five billion only last year. So it seems that Israel understands what's happening here today and is challenged by it, but is also looking outward to different countries. And that's an historical experience that they had with the British. And when the British decided to publish the white paper in 1937, that's when Israel really understood that they needed to find a different superpower to rely on. Are we witnessing s that sort of historical reference taking place today as they seek much more uh, effective alliances elsewhere beyond the U.S., and what should an American really be thinking about that? I mean, that's nothing new, as you point out. Um, I mean, when I covered the wars in Central America, they were trying to fill, you know, build alliances with Guatemala. They built alliances with the right-wing death squads, Arena and El Salvador. Um, they built alliances with the apartheid regime in South Africa. Um, I mean, Israel will take friends wherever they can get them. Um, but the fact is, at least within the Middle East, there is only one military power right now, and that's the United States. And um, I find it hard to believe that any country is going to fill that gap of $3 billion a year in aid. Um, plus, you have all of the diplomatic protection at the UN, that the U.S. has provided cover for Israel now for you know more than six decades. I think losing all of that would be – I mean, you're right that Israel will do everything it can to try and – but I don't know that uh, – I, I would be surprised if any country in Asia would step into that extent to fill that void. And I think that's why Israel is so worried and why they have – I mean, you know, building alliances with the Christian right is insane because these people are all anti-Semites. Um, but it shows, you know, kind of how desperate they are. Um, so, yeah, they certainly will. But I think that if we can knock the pillars out from under them here, um, that is devastating enough that it offers a chance. But it's got to happen here. If it doesn't happen here, and, you know, as good as Europe has been, if it doesn't happen here, Israel can continue to do what it does. Thank you. A couple things. One is we talk about one nuclear power in the Middle East, which is Israel. But I think in the Middle East, U.S. has planes and subs and aircraft carriers and bases that have nuclear weapons. So in the Middle East itself, there are two nuclear powers. The other thing I want to say is, is that from Cheney's standpoint, his utopian um, um, PR stuff was just that. The real reason for the invasion of Iraq was because Iraq used to control all of its oil. The government of Iraq controlled it. It was a successful war from Cheney's standpoint. Now international oil corporations have control of all of Iraq's oil. So the whole thing of weapons of mass destruction and liberators being greeted, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, maybe it was utopian, but it was PR utopia. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I maybe I don't give Cheney enough credit, but I think <laughs> – I actually think Wolfowitz and Pearl – I mean, you're right. I'm not arguing with you. But I think Wolfowitz and Pearl – I think they really are that stupid. Um, I think they really did believe their own insane rhetoric. Um, of course, it was a thrust for oil, um, and it was 
a, a bonanza for the weapons arms industry uh, that never wants this to end, which is why it's not ending. Uh, but I really think they were that self-deluded. I got a taste of it with Elliot Abrams when I covered Central America and I interviewed him, who they brought back. Not that he knew anything about Central America or knows anything about the Middle East. And after that two-hour interview, I walked out and said to my photographer, this guy's insane. <laughs> and I think they're all kind of insane. Um, but you're right. Yeah, I mean, it, it is about control of imperial. I mean, that's why imperialism exists. <laughs> it's about the subjugation of other countries, the theft of their resources, the exploitation of their labor. Um, that's something, you know, that every imperium going back to Rome has done, and we're, of course, no exception. Um, well, since we're getting low on time, why don't we take three questions at a time? Is that okay with you? Okay. And you can try and, uh, I know this uh, webinar has been waiting for a while. So. Uh, following up on the, uh, the, uh, the question from the woman from Jewish Voice for Peace, how do you evaluate the Iran agreement why did it happen, and will have will it have any any implications for the issues you've been discussing? Thanks. I certainly agree that BDS is our less best chance. Although I'm a former international lawyer and and would like to think the ICC was possible, but probably not. I agree with you. It has to be uh, grassroots, and I would think that colleges and universities are a critical battleground there. And we know that um, uh, Haim Sabin, uh, this is Clinton's supporter and advisor, and uh, Sheldon Adelson are now pouring tens of millions of dollars right. into the Maccabees and other groups right. on campuses to squash all of that effort. Uh, you've been on campuses. Tell us what you think the, the future holds there. Uh, Bud Hensgen, um, do you see any efforts or discussion to expand the um, BDS from the West Bank to all of Israel? Okay. So on Iran, we have to remember that the Pentagon was opposed to a war with Iran. They did not want to go to war with Iran. And this has been long standing. So there were powerful forces within the establishment that did not want this. I mean, the interesting thing is about the Pentagon is that they didn't really want to go to war with Iraq. Um, and I had this fascinating experience at the inception of the war when I was denouncing the calls to invade Iraq that I was invited to address the Marine Corps. I was invited to address the State Department by the Arabists. And I was brought to West Point to speak to the graduating class. Um, and you had within the State Department, the intelligence community, and the Pentagon, especially among the Arabists, complete consensus that this was going to be a debacle. Um, so there are powerful forces within the system that do not want to go to war with Iran, the Pentagon being. Uh, and that's extremely important in terms of an impediment. Um, uh, in terms of the campuses, well, what APAC has done is seized all the Hillel houses, uh, <coughs> and they've just become APAC outposts. And then they use that as a kind of organizing base uh, to monitor, spy on, shut down, harass students who organize around justice for Palestine. It's, it's backfiring on them, I think, uh, because I think the game's kind of been found out, and because so many Jewish students of conscience um, see through it. Um, I mean, it's really kind of sad in a way because it's about the promotion of uh, a, a, a neoliberal state policy. It has nothing to do, of course, with the Jewish religion. Um, and then expanding efforts of BDS. Well, I mean, BDS has to target all of Israel. I mean, Caterpillar contracts, uh, you know, anything produced in Israel, Dead Sea soap, what's it called, soda? What's that, soda? soda there you go. <laughs> right, so I, n I never bought it, so I can't boycott it. Um, yeah, HP. I mean, all these people have big contracts. They have to be targeted. 
And that, you know, by the way, is what we're doing in the prison system. We have no hope now of, of reform of mass incarceration. The whole movement is to build uh, boycotts of uh, industries, including McDonald's, Johnson & Johnson, Starbucks, uh, Hewlett Packard, they're all in the prisons. And we have to build boycotts, and then we have to create work stoppages in the prisons uh, so that they're paid minimum wage um, because once the neo-slavery, a lot of prison workers are paid nothing or they earn a dollar a day, they're working eight hours a day. Uh, once you break the back of neo-slavery, the system goes down. So it's interesting that, you know, again, because the larger political system has seized up, um, the, the forms of attack, and for those of us who are involved in ending mass incarceration, are exactly the same as the forms of attack for those of us who want to bring justice to Palestine. And that is building grassroots movements that disrupt the system to such an extent that it has to respond. And I, I wanted to you to address, as a Presbyterian and a Presbyterian minister, some practical applications of what you mean by grassroots resistance. And the reason why I'm asking that, because there's this, there's so much uh, testimony that you give that we, I think we agree with you, but we, we hope you're Cassandra. We, we want it to be otherwise. And I think that if you can push it back to what you know about Presbyterians, what you know about the advisory committee that right now is looking at the one and the two-state solution, you know the forces that are, uh, that are aligned against it in 2016. Can you give us some practical grassroots examples of how that resistance can happen? Well, I, I, I'm not particularly integrated into the institution. Um, I mean, I spend all, all of my work is in the prisons. Uh, but I've already told them I'll go and speak uh, because I know there's going to be a battle. And, you know, I, my argument is that I was the Middle East Bureau Chief for the Times. I spent seven years there. Uh, I probably should say I used to speak Arabic. It's pretty deteriorated, but I, spoke, I studied Arabic pretty extensively. And, um, uh, you know, that's a fight that we're going to have to take. I mean, they are... Uh, they're going to do everything they can to roll that back. Uh, what they're actually doing on the ground, I'm not, I'm not intimately involved in, um, but I know they're there and I know they're trying, and I have asked to go to the GA, and I said I will go if you give me a platform to speak to the entire GA. Um, and I think I have, you know, the, the kind of expertise to validate that uh, request. Um, and I'm hope I've already put the request in, and I hope they grant it. But I, I intend to physically be there to fight them. The industrial complex and uh, the military industrial complex that's op oppressing the Palestinian people. I think it's we don't do it enough. But then I wanted to add, how can we um, include? Um, the middle class white moms who oppose the NRA and who you know are, are fighting for gun control how how do we understand that these are the same evil incarnate the the arms manufacturers that you know that are causing toddlers to shoot their mothers at at Walmart or whatever places we don't go right <laughs> well that that's it's all part of one system and i think the person who really laid that out for me first was norman finkelstein he said, look, stop calling this an Israeli, I mean, I knew it wasn't an Israeli lobby, but he said, this is a neoliberal project. And he's right. And we have to fight neoliberalism. I mean, I will not support Bernie Sanders because he abandons the Palestinian people. And I'm just tired of, I will not abandon the Palestinians. I mean, they are the poorest, most vulnerable, most repressed, most crushed population on the planet who are bombed by one of the most sophisticated militaries which we fund. And I'm not going to play that game. You either stand with all of the oppressed or you stand with none of the oppressed. And uh, we're, I, I'm, 
We are not at a, at a moment where we can pick and choose anymore which oppressed people are convenient for us to support because the world is devolving too quickly. I'm going to look at what's happening in Greece and Europe as I speak. And we who are infected with imperialism and the chauvinism that comes with imperialism have to begin to take the kinds of stances that Corbyn takes. Uh, I'm, I'm sure that they will, you know, use everything in their arsenal to take this guy down. But for 30 years he was a pariah in the political establishment because he actually stood for something and he had integrity. And, um, and I think that you're, you're right. It is all interconnected. And, and we have to build solidarity. Palestinian people who care about justice in Palestine have to care about the system of mass incarceration and the evil of white supremacy and the destruction of our working poor and the, you know all of all of these groups have to come together and I think they will um, you know the people who care about justice in Palestine have to take a Palestinian flag and march in Ferguson with Black Lives Matter that's the only way we're gonna do it if, as long as we stay ghettoized as long as we celebrate a particular form of victimhood, we aren't going to get anywhere. But I think the more those lines are crossed, and I think they are being crossed, the more powerful we become because these are the same forces. You're exactly right. And, and we have to begin to step back and understand these structures of power and how they work. I want to thank you for your really very scary uh, speech today. <laughs> it, it really is. I, you know, you mentioned a couple of things that uh, obliter uh, Palestine might be obliterated. That's scary for, for the world community who care about justice. But you all do also refer to the U U.S. itself. And uh, after saying Montgomery and all these things, you, you brought up Yugoslavia. And that country went into pieces. And from your speech, from what we read in the newspaper, you, you, you're back to hearing black, white, south, north, uh, Republicans, uh, Christians right and Christian left. When you give speeches like this to you know non-Palestinian conscious people, uh, just regular Americans, what's their reaction? Or you, of course you write about this and all that. Well, what's the reaction there? Are they worried where, where we're going? Because whether it's IPAC, the neoliberals or whoever, who are really changing the fabric of this country where we live. And there are people like whoever's here who care. Well, I've been booed off a few stages before. <laughs> uh, you know, and even, you know, I, 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 I always have supported Nader. I never, I did not, I was Nader's speechwriter in 2008 and getting up even in Berkeley and calling Obama out for who we now know Obama is in the same way that my attacks on Sanders angered a lot of people. Um, but I'm not, you know, I, I mean, that's, you know, I have, you face hostile crowds, it's not pleasant. I mean, there are times when I go in and I know, the, especially if I'm at a university or something where it, it's a more neutral audience, I know that uh, oftentimes it will be very hostile and I kind of just put my head down and do it. It's not fun. Um, but it, it's, it has to be done. And I can do it because I'm not a politician. I'm not running for anything. I don't need anyone's adulation. Um, if I did, I'd be finished. Um, and, and so, you know, I think that it, it, we can't talk about effective resistance if we don't understand the reality around us. Then we're responding to a creation, a self-delusion. And, I mean, we haven't even gotten into climate change. <laughs> yeah, we have no time left. And that's why that if we don't break the back of this neoliberal, corporate, oligarchic, global elite, we're finished. And we have no time. We have to take it back. Because if they continue to control where we're headed, 
there will be no ecosystem capable of sustaining human life. Um, and, and that's what makes this fight so important. And that's what makes the fight for Palestine a piece of the much larger fight to wrest back control, to restore the consent of the governed, to rebuild the common good. Um, and, and we have very powerful forces, especially in this country. We are the most watched, monitored, eavesdropped, photographed population in human history. And I covered the Stasi state in East Germany. Sure. Do you, do you see one day the Palestinian refugees will move in mass rather than go to Germany, will go to the Israeli borders and over, overpower the Israelis in that sense? What, all they have to do is say, we want to we go home. We're not, we're not, our, our home is in, it's not in Germany. Our home in Haifa and Yaffa and the Nazareth and what have you. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, you have spent some time as a journalist with the New York Times, and I was wondering from your personal experience, what kind of pressures are journalists at the New York Times facing? I'm here as a member of the United Church of Christ, and at our synod in June, they passed support for BDS by a lot more than four votes. Um, <laughs> um, my question really is, what, how do you advise folks like the people, I, the committees I work with locally? Uh, since we're not connected with universities, what would you see as one or two really good things we could be doing in support of that? Okay. Um, well, the issue of refugees, I mean, is Israel's most fervent wish is to tear down the border between Gaza and Egypt and get rid of the Gaza population. Um, they, of course, are never going to allow the right of return for all the reasons you understand. Um, and. And so they have instituted, as Pape correctly terms it, and which I said before, a slow motion genocide, where they've already driven out the middle class and the upper class, uh, people who have the means to get out. And the idea is just to make life so miserable um, that you don't want to stay, uh, while at the same time not allowing people to return. And that's been a policy that Israel has adopted for a long time, uh, and and <coughs> you you just physically can't go from Gaza to Haifa. You can't. It's physically impossible. Um, even I can't go from Gaza to Haifa anymore. So, yeah. Uh, in terms of the New York Times, well, I played a game with the New York Times for 15 years, and it went like this. I never wanted to cover anything that was prestigious. I never wanted to hang out with powerful people. Uh, and I always volunteered to go to the places no other New York Times reporter wanted to go, uh, like Gaza um, and, uh, or Yugoslavia. I remember when I told them I wanted to cover the war in Yugoslavia, the executive editor, Joe Lelyveld, said, well, I guess the line starts and ends with you. Uh, and I'll speak at journalism schools, and the kids, especially in places like Columbia, they'll go, how can we be the Paris bureau chief? I go, you are asking the wrong person. I have no – so the only way I could spend 15 years at the Times was to put myself in very dangerous places where there was horrific oppression and write about it. And when I came back to the United States, I said my one non-negotiable demand is I will not go to Washington because I don't want to do lunch with someone at the State Department. I don't want to stand behind a barricade shouting at the president. I don't, I don't want to be around powerful people. 
Um, and so I, with all of the institutional problems which are there, and they are there, I managed to place myself in situations where I could work with integrity. So I was writing, if Israel bombed Gaza, I went to the bombing site, I counted the bodies, I, and I wrote it. And believe me, the Israelis hated it. Um, and it put my, physically, of course, especially in Sarajevo, it was very dangerous work. Um, but it was work that I felt was worthwhile. And then when I came back to the United States after the war in Kosovo, that's when I ran afoul of the institution. I had been already a foreign correspondent for the Dallas newspaper when I was hired, so I'd never worked in the newsroom. And war correspondents never make a transition back into newsrooms because when you hire a war cor a successful war correspondent, it's somebody who is paid to defy authority, not only defy authority, but to defy an authority that's trying to kill you. Um, and when you come back into the corporate setting of the New York Times, that particular personality is highly unpalatable. Um, and none of us last. Uh, and in my case, I, you know, I, I was on Charlie Rose and these shows talking about why I was insane to invade Iraq, and then I gave a commencement address at Rockford College where I denounced the war and I was booed off the stage and they cut my microphone twice and at one point 1,000 people got up and started singing God Bless America. <laughs> it's on YouTube. And uh, <laughs> they wouldn't even hand the diplomas while I was seated up there because they were too afraid that the students would attack me. And so campus security comes up and says, okay, you got to leave. So this is before they even given the diplomas. And I go, but my jacket, it's in the president's office. They said, we'll mail you your jacket. <laughs> and they drive me to my hotel, and they stand with me while I, while I pack my stuff, and they put me on a bus to Chicago. Um, and the Times, you know, got a lot of pressure, and so they gave me a formal written reprimand saying that I was not allowed to speak about Iraq because I was impugning the impartiality of the New York Times. I, I don't, I, you know, I, I, uh, I, okay, I'll tell my story about ordination. I, I don't want to present myself as a spokesperson for the Presbyterian Church. What happened is I, you know, like a lot of people who work outside an institution, I don't have health insurance. So I teach in the prison, and the Presbyterian Church gave me health insurance in exchange for it. Then in the beneficence of the administrative hierarchy of the Presbyterian Church, they said, well, he's not ordained. Why are we giving him health insurance? Well, the only thing I lacked were the five ordination exams, three hours each, including Biblical Greek. And so I took them and I passed them. And I said to the church, okay. And so, but then I had the thorny problem of having to be ordained. And I had this nightmare of sitting in a suburban white Presbyterian church and a bunch of white guys coming down in robes, which I couldn't handle. And so uh, I did it in an inner city church and Cornell West and James Cone, and if you do not know James Cone, this is the most important theologian in America. This guy's real. Cross and lynching tree is, it doesn't matter what faith you are, you've got to read that book. I mean, he's the guy who calls the white Christian church the Antichrist. And he says, you know, where were they at lynching? What white theologian, what white church? This guy's incredible. Anyway, and he preached. And we brought a blues band, and I invited all the families of my students in the prison. So it was real. Uh, but that was really the end of, and then I went right back in the prison. So I don't, I don't pretend in any way to represent in any shape or form the Presbyterian Church. I spent all my time with Muslims in a prison. Hi, my name is Caroline. I have a question. So in addition to the, I'm going to be very quick because I know people are getting tired. In addition to the indirect complicity of the American people in the Israeli establishment of oppression of the Palestinian people, what about the direct complicity, such as, for example, the latest study that showed about 60,000 Americans are living yeah. in settlements on hilltops. Oh, right. And Hununu, that actually keeps funding those people. So my question would be, what should the regular American citizen do in order to pursue some form of questioning at least you know with the administration about to deal with those settler terrorists who are 
primarily Americans, let's be honest, or at least designate them as a terrorist organization. And how far do you think BDS can go? Can it also go to boycotting groups such as Hanunu that operate primarily on U.S. soil? Yeah. Um, yeah. The, I mean, and also all these sellers are walking around with M16s. They all seem to have an amazing weight problem. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you go to the settlements, it's all Russian and, and American. And, uh, and you're right, they are terrorists. Um, you know, the, the Committee to Protect the Highways, all these kinds of groups that will stop Palestinian cars and beat people. And uh, I just, I don't put, I just, I think that putting energy into the political establishment and getting it to respond rationally is not a good use of our time. Um, everything you say is true, uh, but it gets back to the fact that the system now has been shut down to such an extent that we can no longer have a rational debate. Certainly on the airwaves, there's no rational debate about this issue at all. And, I mean, I watch all these so-called Middle East experts. I mean, these people, you know, where did they come from? I mean, they don't speak Arabic. They've never been there. Uh, and and yet, and those of us who have spent significant time in the region but are not parroting back the official narrative, we're completely shut out. So, you know, it's almost group by group, person by person, because the airwaves, we've been locked out of the airwaves. And um, every, I mean, you're right, they are terrorist groups, but if you say that within the mainstream, you, you just get checked off because the reality of what's happening has been so effectively masked from the public. And it's worse. I mean, when I began, all of the networks had bureaus. They all had correspondence. I mean, it's, I've watched the contraction. All of the major regional papers, Dallas, Baltimore, Philadelphia, they all had foreign sections, often foreign correspondence, and the Boston Globe had like six or seven, the Inquirer, it's all gone. It's all gone. And, and that has contributed to the kind of dumbing down of the country, um, where people s just communicate in kind of idiotic cliches, which are the enemy of clear thought. So um, to invest all of your energy to get a fair hearing in the media or to invest all of your energy to get a fair response from an elected official who spends half of his day across the street dialing for dollars. Anyway, it just is not a good, good use of our time. You know, we've got to take the system down. We've got to take the whole thing down. It's called overthrow. I'll repeat that for Homeland Security if they're here. No, I mean... <laughs> We got to we got to take our country back. They took it from us, and we got to take it back. And we're not going to take it back by appealing to them, um, because they they're doing quite well on the deal, and we're not. 